Oh, church, how good it is to be together. Welcome to worship this morning. You're so glad that we, I'm so glad that you're with us this morning as we talk about God in creation and God in community. My name is Andy Manick. I'm lead pastor of the United Methodist Church here. Uh, I've been invited back for now my third straight Sunday. I feel like we're growing in grace with one another. I'm very excited about that. We are in the middle of a series called Come and See. And as a part of that, we've talked about seeing God in the unknown our first week with asking the question, can anything good come out of Nazareth? Can anything good come out of Valencia or a goofy pastor like me? Well, the answer is come and see. Come and experience all that God is doing in new things. Last week, we talked about God in our lives. We used the story of the woman at the well to talk about how we could come and see God in our story and how God is, in fact, inviting us to use our stories to help other people to come and see God. Well, this morning we're talking about God in creation and God in community. So the question I want to start with is, where in God's creation, where in the world that surrounds you, have you seen God? Where have you seen God as it surrounds you? Mountaintops, river's edge, at the beach, at pre-dawn hour just as the sun begins to rise? In the faces of your loved ones, we start with the question, where have you seen signs of God in the world around you? You know that I'm a, a Star Wars fan, so I'm a big fan of space and science fiction. So one of the things that's been true over the last week and a half is one of the places where I'm clearly seeing God in creation is in the pictures from the James Webb Telescope that have come out. If you haven't seen these glorious images, so many of them are capturing the same exact lens of reference as the Hubble telescope has over the last two decades or so. But this new telescope with its mirrored systems and its capacity for a higher definition picture are giving us images like these that are profound. They are so crisp that if this was an iPad, you could blow it up with your fingers and get in so close to these clusters of galaxies and the power of it. It is the kind of thing that will make the psalmist say, as you'll see this morning, how awesome are your deeds, O God. So great is your power. And when I look at these images and I think of those words, what strikes me is these expanding galleries, these clusters of stars, these black holes with this tremendous amount of gravity that's affecting the entire universe around us, these images that seem to remind us of the very eye of God itself. There's such richness and such vastness, such beauty and such power. And when I think about the age of the universe and the vastness of God and the eternity of God, it is not lost on me that that same God loves me. And that same God loves each of you. I couldn't even point to where you are in that picture. We are small creatures, but beloved nonetheless. I want to invite you to join me in a moment of prayer as we prepare again and look at our text this morning. Uh, But uh, the Apostle Paul says, pray for me as I pray for you. And he invites the model of pastors praying for their people and people praying for the pastors. This has been a long, hard week for me. Um, I've discovered six weeks in advance of my 45th birthday that I'm in fact old. Uh, As I went to the doctor's office and I was assigned new aids. Readers for the first time in my life. And the thing that strikes me is, is I'm really impressed that my iPad is in fact high definition as promised. Everything is so crisp and so clear now. But let's pray. Gracious God who gives us vision, who gives us life. Help us to see you in your creation. Help us to see you in our community. Help us to see you in your word. Bless us as we've gathered that we might be able to say that in this place, that the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts, that they might be acceptable in your eyes, O Lord, who is our strength and the source of all salvation. Amen. This morning's journey into God's Word and Scripture takes us to the Psalms. Psalm 66. It says, For the director of music, a song, a psalm. So you are prepared. Shout with joy to God, all the earth. Sing the glory of his name. Make his praise glorious. Say to God, how awesome are your deeds. So great is your power that your enemies cringe before you. All the earth bows down to you. They sing praise to you. They sing praise to your name. Come and see what God has done. Well, there it is again. Come and see what God has done. How awesome his works on our behalf. He turned the sea into dry land. They passed through the waters on foot. Come, let us rejoice in him. He rules forever by his power. His eyes watch the nations. Let not the rebellious rise up against him. 
And then in the printed version of the Psalms, there's a word that follows there, salah, S-E-L-A-H, which in some ways means to breathe, to rest on, and to consider what God or the psalmist has shared with us. And so in that spirit, in salah, we breathe and we consider what God has to say to us. Come and see what God has done, God's awesome deeds for humankind. Not just the faraway ones with the majesty of science and technology that allow us to look to the other ends of the universe, but come and see what God is doing right here in our midst. The psalmist wants to remind people of God's work by pointing them back to a common history, who they are, who they've been, where they've been together, that God had not forgotten them, and you can anticipate that God will not forget you today and that God will not forget you tomorrow. God's delivered them from the, uh, the Egyptians and delivered those Israelites through dry land across the Red Sea, across the Jordan River into a land of abundance. I want to ask you a question, church. How do you greet the day? Are you a morning person? Do you roll out of bed and smile and say, this is the day that the Lord has made. I am ready to get it started. Or does that happen after your third cup of coffee? (laughs) Maybe you, like Pastor Camille, has a spouse that just bugs you because they are the morning person and you are not. I'm up early, mostly because the dogs want to go out. But I need the reminder of the work of the psalmist. Because as he begins, he says, Shout with joy to God, all the earth, share the glory of God. That's a way to greet the day. Shouting to God with joy for all that God does. Giving God thanks and praise for God's presence in your story. But in the same way I'm going to invite you this morning to see God in creation, I also want you to hear me say, I want to invite the world into our experience of creation. I want the world to be able to see how we see the world around us and how we answer these questions, knowing who you are and knowing whose you are. You see, when we understand that we are all God's children, that we are all kindred, that we are all brothers and sisters, not just because of a common ancestor or a common baptism or a common confession, but because we literally share the same creator, it rewrites our understanding of creation. It reminds us not just I am Andy, but knowing whose I am, the dynamic of a relationship that I have with the divine helps me to reset and to say I'm a creature of God. And so too are each of you. And the cracks and flaws in me as a creation and the cracks and flaws in you are all a part of an imperfect but beautiful system of God's hope for the work of creation. Know who you are. Know whose you are. Because we are all creative creatures. We've all been made in the image and by the very spirit and work of our God, but that invitation is for us then to be creative to experience creation, to know its value and its story, to see the world around us in new eyes, to begin to appreciate the world that surrounds us and the beauty of creation. I want to share a poem with you real quickly. The 20th century American poet David Wagoner, uh, Pacific Northwest guy, University of Washington, writes this poem, Lost. Stand still. The trees ahead and the bushes beside you are not lost. Wherever you are is called here, and you must treat it as a powerful stranger, must ask permission to know it and be known. The forest breathes. Listen, it answers. I've made this place around you. If you leave it, you may come back again saying, here. No two trees are the same to the raven. No two branches are the same to Sister Wren. If what a tree or a bush does is lost on you, well, then you are surely lost. Stand still. The forest knows where you are. You must let it find you. We are woven into a fabric of creation that gives us value and helps us to know the value of creation that surrounds us in a way that we can hold stewardship of it. God has given us our senses that we might experience God. Do you understand, church, that God longs to be experienced by you? 
It's a deep hope of God, our creator, to be experienced by humanity, and our senses are a part of that experience. And so when we invite people under the auspices of come and see, one of the questions we get to ask of each other is, what does God look like? Now, some of you are picturing an old man with a big beard on a, you know, 15-foot chair who talks like James Earl Jones, and, you know, and just, you know, big, deep voice judging all creation. That is somebody else's picture of God. What I mean is, what things do you see that remind you of God? Sunsets. Home. Lost home. People you remember. People you wish you could forgive. All of these are things that we see that help us to know who God is. The psalmist will continue in a little bit. Come and hear the work of God. So we ask ourselves, what does God sound like? And again, I don't mean James Earl Jones, your favorite low-speaking male voice. It got to heaven and God sounded like this. You'd have to be okay with it. You would have no other choice. It's not what I mean. What sounds remind you of the very presence of God? Your spouse's deep laugh? Your children's voices? Babbling brooks. Ocean waves on the shore. What does God sound like? Those are the two most frequently used come ands from experience. But there's also the opportunity to come and feel. And when you ask me, what does God feel like? Oftentimes we begin to get philosophical and heady. Well, God feels like this eternal spirit, the very ground of my being. Not what I mean. What touch reminds you of God? Is it seashells? Or the sand under your bare feet? Tilled soil? Your grandchild's hand in yours? What does God feel like? Oh, and then it starts to get really exciting. What does God taste like? Uh, Pastor Andy, what exactly are you getting at? What tastes remind you of the divine? Now, if you're a good Methodist, your answer starts with, King's Hawaiian bread dipped appropriately into Welch's grape juice taken in one mouthful together. That is what God tastes like. But beyond that, what taste sensations draw you into the presence of God. Maybe because they have a profound impact on an experience you've had, that time you spent away with friends. S'mores from a campfire, from a campfire experience that touched your life. What does God taste like? And then the last and weirdest one of all, what does God smell like? Hopefully not me on a long, hot day. What does God smell like? What smells remind you of the very presence of God? This all started with the idea that God has given our senses that God might be experienced. So there are smells that God has gifted you with that are a reminder of God's holy presence in your story. Maybe it's your favorite cookie baked by your favorite grandmother who always had them in the oven when she knew you were coming to visit. And that smell just draws you into a sense of holiness and hope and memories that are as thick as flies. What does God smell like? The psalmist greets the day by saying, Shout with joy to God all the earth with the fullness of your experience. But what happens next? Keep watching. Psalm 66, verse 8, continues our story. Praise our God, O peoples. Let the sound of his praise be heard, for he has preserved our lives and kept our feet from slipping. For you, O God, tested us. You refined us like silver. You brought us into prison and laid burdens on our backs. You let men ride over our heads, and we went through fire and water, but you brought us to a place of abundance. Before we go from the slide, I want you to pay attention to something important that the psalmist does here. Yes, the psalmist describes some suffering and some struggle. You sent us to prison. You allowed them to ride over our heads. But notice the change in language. That whole first section was about a vague God. Shout to God, all the earth. There's a God out there that maybe you've heard about. What does the psalmist do in these verses? Well, the whole tone changes. From an impersonal, out there God to you. A God I know and a God that knows me. 
This transition from God and creation is a move from thinking you see God out there to appreciating a God who is a part of you and your story. It's a story about a God in creation to our praise for our God in common. And the gift of worship is that is accomplished in this space. Where you take how you have seen God out in creation and you bring it and you set it down next to others and allow us to work on one another and to share the work of God in our lives and in our stories. We begin to have things in common and things that are different that allows us to appreciate the variety of ways that God is working in our story because it may be that every answer that you give to what does God look, sound, feel, taste, and smell like might be radically different from your neighbors, your spouses, or certainly mine. And that's the beauty of it that God would find the way to speak to us. A transition from a vague God out there to praise for our God in common. When we come and see God in community, it is about the ability to see God with others, yes. Whether you're online or you're in the room, you are experiencing the songs of worship, the preaching of worship, the prayers of worship, the generosity of worship, all of these pieces are a common experience with God. Yes, you are seeing God with others in a time like worship, but it is also a reminder, an absolute siren's call for you to be able to see God in others, not just with. To learn to appreciate that if we are going to tell a story about our God, it is an opportunity for us to bring that which we hold in common and celebrate and that which is different between us and bring that all to the table that we might be able to see it together. One last section from the psalmist. Watch this. I'm going to skip down to verse 16. Come and listen, or come and hear. Ah, Change of tone. Come and hear, all you who fear God. Let me tell you what he's done for me. I cried out to him with my mouth. His praise was on my tongue. If I had cherished sin in my heart, the Lord would not have listened. But God has surely listened and heard my voice in prayer. Praise be to God who has not rejected my prayer or withheld his love for me. The tone has changed again. The psalmist starts with a vague God in all of creation who delivered us in history to a God that the psalmist knows, you, O God, to now a story to share, one that overflows from his experience of not just the history of God, but God in his present moment. Come and hear what God is doing Come and hear my story and how God is at work in me. Seeing God in community is an opportunity for you to have a deeper testimony to the work of God in your experience. To learn to be able to say to your friends, your neighbors, your family, I know this God. He's mine and yours, and let's find him together. It is enough to be able to say, God loves me. God loves you. It is enough to be able to say, God forgives me and God forgives you. Our growing edge is learning to name the places where God has hurt us in the way that the psalmist does. How to be able to say, God heard my cry, God knows my story, God knows my name, and to learn to identify places. Can you name places in your life? where you know that God has heard you? Do you long for the experience that maybe you've seen in somebody else who shares a pew with you, where you know God has heard them and you feel like maybe God hasn't heard you in much the same way? This psalm reminds us of the opportunity to name the places where God has heard us. So we see God in our common community. And when we do that, there's a change that happens. It transforms our perspective. It changes us from a God who is way out there, or maybe like those James Webb uh, telescope pictures, God that is far away and big and has a scope and a scale that I cannot possibly see or appreciate, a God who is vague and judgmental, a God who is not of me or for me, and brings that down in a narrowing and holy way to a God who is just for me just for us, 
Not in a way that is exclusive or casting out, but in a way that claims God loves us deeply. And that's a love that we are then equipped to share with the world. When we do that, it changes our hearts. A softening, a reshaping, a new sense of vision. It can do that in me, it will do that in you, it will do that in the other, as brash or abrasive as they are. Because we all get to answer the questions. What does God look like, sound like, feel like, taste like, smell like? And when we lay those answers down together, we don't just see the jagged edges where those answers don't line up. It is more like a tapestry that says, I learn to begin to appreciate the beauty of the ways in which God is reaching you. And let me share some of how God is reaching me. And that is a work that is never complete. It's why you ought to come to worship. Because when you don't, you deny us the opportunity to be able to experience from you how you are seeing and experiencing God. We are incomplete when you are absent from us. The invitation to come and see is not just about the opportunity to come and observe. It is about the chance to come and be the people of God. Thanks be to that God. Let's pray.